So, here's the second one, something that we also did. Um, the presentation talks about creating a firmware image that's embedded into UFI. I also, however, wanted to spend probably half of this presentation telling of why this was important to us, or at least useful. I also wanted to talk about virtualization a little bit and confidential computing. I did try to find someone who also works on virtualization here, and I didn't. So I find this might be rather interesting in itself. So, yeah, initially, I would like to talk about AMD 7SNP, which is the AMD confidential computing technology, how does it help attestation, and what it does in itself. Then I will actually talk about embedding a UFI application into the flash image, and then having it boot automatically. The goal would be to create a, an enclave out of UFI, which is a very bizarre idea, but allows doing it rather quickly, assuming one can build a UFI application and modify EFI in the correct places. So yes, first let's talk about 7SNP and how does it sell at the station. So first of all, what is confidential computing? So confidential computing is a new up and coming technology or set of technologies geared toward protecting uh, data in use. Data in use is being protected against uh, different, so this is purely used for virtualization and whenever a customer decides to run a VM, they want to make sure that A, the VM is secure from other VMs, and two, the, the VM is secure from the hypervisor itself. This is right now growing, but it's a security measure, and the whole confidential computing stack touches a lot of different of those things. So data in use initially can simply mean memory. AMD has three major technologies right now that are sort of uh, developments on top of each other. So first we have AMD Ceph, Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Ceph, on a very high level, gives us protection against uh, the host being able or other VMs to access the memory. So a guest has a special bit in the page tables where it flipped, which is what the function I made before was for, will make sure that a special AMD Secure Processor will go through and encrypt the memory. This makes sure that even if the host manages to read the memory, well, nothing will happen. The other one is encrypted state. Encrypted state, in our case, means the state of the CPU, so the register values. Now, whenever anybody does any sort of instruction that causes an exit outside of the VM to a hypervisor, the way it typically works is there's a page in the memory, and the VM copies all the register values. Now, a hypervisor performing an attack might keep on interrupting the VM and actually get access to those register values and learn more than they should. So the whole idea for encrypted state is that since we've already gotten memory encryption from the previous technologies, to put it in an encrypted page. Now, this isn't as obvious as it seems because, and I'm typically an x86 person, for instance, CPID, when called, requires access to a few registers. This is handled by a special exception handler, and the fact that uh, whenever this actually happens, the guest will copy only those specific registers that are required for that specific cause. So I think RAX and RCX are being used by CPID. Only those two will get copied. The rest end up in a memory encrypted page, and so forth. Since the host might modify some registers when returning back to the guest, only those will get out. And then the third one, which is an amalgamation of a lot of additional securities, is secure nested paging. With secure nested paging, AMD provides an RMP, uh, which is a special structure that defines who's actually the owner of the page and has the page been validated by a guest. The problem, for instance, that this solves is encrypting memory doesn't save us against replay attacks. The host, for instance, could copy the encrypted memory, put the encrypted memory back in, and will perform an attack. This makes sure that the integrity is correct. It also adds attestation, but I'll talk about it briefly in a second. So yes, attestation is the process of validating the integrity of the computational environment. And this is, again, mostly a virtualization case that I'm talking about. Well. Whenever we talk about all this added security, whenever we talk about making sure that everything works exactly the way we want, we as a customer running against VM would like to be able to be sure that this is actually our VM. 
that this runs the firmware we expected, that the workload is as expected. Uh, even secure boot that has been a very large topic here without proper attestation, a malicious hypervisor might, for instance, create a fake TPM, and the fake TPM might fool the customer that they're actually running on secure boot why they want. So attestation has been a very large topic uh, in virtualization security in itself. Now, AMD Service SMP does not give us full attestation. However, it provides a baseline. The baseline allows us to make sure that the CPU we're running on is exactly as we're expecting, the PSP, so the platform uh, secure processors code is exactly as we expected, and it validates the initial workload. In our case, the initial workload would be the flash image of the UV. Now, this doesn't help us further, right? Because whenever drives are impacted later on, whenever we load drop, then when we need to get the kernel, that doesn't get properly validated. However, this part is. And this actually creates an idea of making a fully attestable environment out of UFI without too much work. So if we manage to put the whole workload inside the firmware image, so that that's actually what gets loaded initially, and make sure that it doesn't leave that image, and that's what gets computated, we get a very simple way of creating a secure enclave out of UFI. So it won't be using for booting this time. That will allow us to run a basic computation, perhaps some cryptography functions, for instance. And yes, so there's going to be two other parts of this. First of all, actually making sure. This is probably obvious to everyone, but was rather convoluted to get right for me. First of all, making sure that we actually get the UFI application into the ROM correctly and it becomes part of the package. And then second, actually getting UFI to run it. So first, let's talk about adding a UFI application to ROM. This is, this is interesting, because whenever I gave this in my teams, this was the hardest part. Well, I assume here the most interesting part is the virtualization. But yes, so UFI has the major free files that we're going to be caring about here. It has the DSC, it has the FDF, and it has the INF. The DSC describes everything that goes into our image. The FDF describes the flash drive format itself, necessary for adding things to the flash image. And then the in files describe very specific modules in itself in the UFI ecosystem. So yes, in order to look at an application that got added into UFI, well, UFI has a few applications in itself, right? There, there is a special folder. There is a special folder uh, called applications. It has a test application, and it also has a UI application. The UI application is pretty much what shows up when someone boots UFI and it doesn't find any other drives. So since we know it's there, since we know it's already linked, it's present in both the standard OVMF and most implementation. Let's take a look how it was added. So first of all, it has a simple entry in the DSC file, which shows, well, right here. Second, let's look at the FDF file. This was surprising to me that that's everything you need to do. But it also contains the entry for an info. There's, however, a problem. So previously, we talked about building applications from GNU EFI. And now I know that there's various different ways of doing it. GNU EFI does not generate an in file by itself. It's not really necessary. So all the applications we've mentioned before, they're placed in the UFI directory. They all have int packages. They're built as modules. They have access to everything. That's pretty. With GNU EFI, it's not. It's also a problem whenever we want to work a roadload that we did not build by ourselves. So perhaps someone will handle you, please make an enclave out of this. Well, we, we don't really have everything that's necessary. And it's surprising there's a very simple fix in UFI for itself. Well, one can define an in file that simply describes the PE32 binary. It can be placed next to the binary, and then that binary can be added similarly to the UI app interesting thing about this solution as well is that if we put this in a specific folder, we alter the DSC file to include the application from that folder, we alter the FDF file, now we can, no matter which application we put there, it will work and it will compile. There's also size issues, so we might have to fiddle with the ROM size in case someone creates something large. OVMF pretty simply supports up to 16 megs. So that's not really an issue unless there's a very large workload running on there. And that allows us to create a simple build system with a simple definition that will take any application source, put it in there, and build. 
So we do have a simple way of adding essentially whatever we desire to the firmware image. The other problem is actually running it. Because if one simply puts it in there, well, the UFI variables will pick up the boot order. The boot order typically doesn't point towards the ROM and then will boot as usual. So the, the sole uh, way uh, that we've done this, it's good. We're halfway there, but we're not booting it yet. And actually, there's three ways we've sort of considered doing this. So first of all, and the first one is rather bizarre, if the FDF files don't work, we could theoretically create a file system inside the ROM, use it as a bootable device, point towards there, and get it running. The other two actually utilize the FDF change I mentioned. So first of all, we can actually use UFI variables. And second of all, we can modify a part of UFI. So yes, I mentioned creating a file system, putting it in there, trying to add it as a drive. Well, this was dropped because it worked. I did, however, Google a little bit, and I did find a forum post in the UFI groups of someone saying they do it, but they were asked how they did it. I think they responded it worked, and that was it. <laughs> so <laughs> the amount of research turned out to be too large to replicate the steps, and the post was from 10 years ago, so yeah. But it's an option. It's an option if, if all the others didn't work. And the other two are actually using UFI variables. So UFI maintains a store of variables that essentially design a lot of things. One of those is defining all the locations of which we can boot from. So this is an example of creating a UFI variable that will boot from the firmware with the GUIs we've mentioned before. So we essentially create a string, FV, one GUID inside, and then FV file, second GUID inside. The first GUID uh, comes from the firmware, because everything in UFI is good, and so are FDF files. The other one comes from the application itself, which is what we put in our custom in file. And again, this will put anything that's in there, as long as it's represented by that in file. Very simple to do. There's, however, a problem. In a lot of hypervisor, it's implementation specific, but UFI variables can be modified externally. So that's one thing we need to worry about. The other problem is, well, we would like, if we create a UFI enclave, for it to have a very consistent behavior. A situation where we boot it uh, in a machine and then it goes into a drive because for something the firmware image didn't work while the drive was present and it contained a maybe malicious application that's not necessarily encouraged. So this works, it's a great proof of concept, but it leaves a little bit to be desired from a simplicity and security point of view. So in order to talk about this later, I, I got permission to copy this image of the UFI boot order that I've seen every single time I look at the UFI the documentation. And, and UFI boots in stages, as we know. So there's the initial security stage, and PI has more bring up. Dixie has drivers already. By the time Dixie is finished, all of the UFI has been brought up. And then we have the BDS stage. Uh, Yes, we have the BDS stage, and the BDS stage is responsible for trying to iterate all of our bootable devices and trying to actually pick up a UFI application with the correct order that will work, that will take us farther down, hopefully trigger exit boot services, boot the OS. Well, the simplest idea actually, and I've seen that happen a few times in the UFI uh, EDK2 codebase already, so we were in the first ones, would be to take a look at modifying the BDS stage. So the BDS phase is fairly small. It's around, I think, four files. They're in a very specific location. And rather than triggering a UFI variable, we could remove the whole lookup for UFI variables. We could make sure that upon boot up, well, EDK2 won't go looking for something to boot, but go directly into the application located in the flash image. And this is the magical line that needs to get put there. After this, well, it will work. Uh, the only thing we need to do is, yes, make sure that all the other calls to anything, any boot variables are removed, that no drives are triggered, that we don't pick boot by accident, which is well, a different security issue if we talk about the driver stack in UFI. And together with this change, the whole thing will be entirely self-contained. Yeah, and this is pretty much what I mentioned. It gives us exactly full control of everything we want. Right now, we can move any app into UFI as long as we trigger our build system. It's going to get in there. The app always will get called. All the thing will crash. So we do have additional safety. 
There is, however, a problem with creating a custom BDS uh, phase, and that is, well, what if things go out of sync? UFI gets updated, new GUIs get added, they should be auto-generated, sometimes they're not. So we might get a collision with something, new libraries might get called. Within, we have not seen too many issues with this, that's what I'm going towards. So at least this part of the call base is not that dynamic that this would cause an issue, but compared to simply making a variable, well, it creates a risk that I wanted to mention. And yeah, this is it. In a summary, with all of this, with very simple changes to UFI, which is the most interesting part, we could actually use it to something completely different. So rather than using it to boot a device, we could make it a new enclave-like environment. One interesting piece of trivia that bit us in the beginning is, well, if our app doesn't exit boot services, and we did mention before that, well, exit boot services is necessary to, for instance, boot into the OS, it gives additional security, it makes sure that things that shouldn't be called no longer get called, like allocating memory. Well, our workload will probably want to allocate memory, so exiting boot services is not that necessary here. Which means that from the perspective of UFI, whenever this workload runs for a few hours, UFI has been running and it has not booted into anything. UFI has a watchdog. The watchdog triggers itself after five minutes. So <laughs> we've seen a rather bizarre bug where, uh, yeah, the, the application would reboot every five minutes. But it was rather simple to disable. Uh, it's something that was completely not uh, anticipated. And that's it. Thank you very much.